I'm showing this because this is like my little tributary into big data. And I'm watching 33,000 people, which is a very small little tiny number of the tweets that are going through or the people who are on Twitter. Twitter has 300 million tweets a day. And uh, I heard they're gathering three to five terabytes of data twice, right? Because for each tweet, there's two of them. There's a log file that you don't see. And they're probably logging every click you make. And Bitly is logging every click you make on a little short link, right? And the data scientists over at Bitly are really trying to see patterns. Uh, a few hours ago, Flipboard, or Flipboard just announced a new audio thing in their new, uh, in their iPad reader. And I was over there and talking to them, and they're logging everything that you do on Flipboard. So uh, how many people are not on Facebook here? Yeah. Everybody else, can you raise your hand? OK. How many people have, no, keep, keep your hands up. Come on. Everybody who has a, flip, a Facebook account. How many people have more than, 40, more than 50 likes? on their Facebook profile. If you don't have more than 40, 50 likes, put your hand down. Yeah, you can see this is the big data problem because next year that number will be way higher than it is today. And every one of our data systems that we are studying is gathering more and more and more data and it's going up at an exponential rate, you know? The White House. If you go to the uh, uh, Palantir over here in Palo Alto and you start talking to the guys who run Palantir, they study our patterns and look, they're looking for terrorists amongst us. They're looking at the patterns. They are studying this at a very deep level and the things that they're looking for are really interesting. Um, if you look at how big data is changing our world, we're able to now gather so much information Right now, my iPhone, for instance, is, is sent, sending up to uh, PlaceMe, a new company that you probably haven't heard of. It's sending up everything that this sensor is doing. It's studying my compass, my accelerometer. It knows whether it's been in a car wreck. Uh, it knows whether I'm running, whether I'm jogging, whether I'm walking, whether I'm standing. It probably can sense that I'm nervous. In fact, at, at, when I give this talk, a longer version of this talk on, at the next web in Amsterdam, I was wearing a galvanic skin response um, device that was studying my emotions as I was giving the talk. And it was feeding that in real time over to an iPhone, which was feeding it to a cloud system. And he could tell I was nervous at the beginning and I got calmer as I gave the talk. And then he started talking about the red light district and that spiked it. <laughs> The things that these systems are going to learn about and study about us is one thing. But then you go and talk to Walmart or Target and ask them, how many data streams are you studying like the Twitter stream? And they go, it's going up every year, right? And we're going to hear about you know, all, these, all these guys who are studying this big data problem. Uh, uh, the execs at VMware told me that last year they sent their uh, engineers on a road trip and asked people their customers, their best customers, who is doing big data? Nobody. He said, we just did it again two months ago. Huge numbers of companies are doing big data and have started uh, de deployments of the technology you're going to see on uh, talk about today. It's pretty crazy what's going on. It's going up faster and faster. You know, the Google self-driving car that was invented just a couple blocks away, it, it was invented here at Stanford partly invented here. Every time that laser spins, it's 80 lasers, it's grabbing all the 3D data in the world. And it's storing that in a database. And then it's going to decide what of that data gets pushed up to the Google Cloud. Because if there's a sign change or an accident or something, it's going to grab that data and put, push it back up. It's really remarkable technology, but we're not slowing down. I visited CERN. And the sensors at CERN are kicking off petabytes of data per minute, I think. It's, cr it's a crazy amount of data. When they do a particle acceleration and they crash those particles together, it sprays stuff you can't see all over the place. But they have many, 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 many sensors in this huge tunnel. And those sensors are gathering data and spitting them through a system. It's big data, right? And they have systems to filter that data 
and then shove it around the world in real time so that scientists can study that big data and see some patterns in it and understand whether they found the next new element or whatnot that they're studying. Uh, Waze is uh, up on my screen. I use this while driving here in Silicon Valley. And uh, this is an Israeli company. They do real-time traffic study. So you can see me on the road. It's, it's an anom anonymized, so you can't see that it's Robert Scoble, but I'm there driving around. And it's, it's getting three terabytes of data a day, and they only have 12 million users. So imagine if every cell phone in the world had this thing. What would that data set look like? And he said, even with just the small numbers of users that they have, they can see new ways to build cities and optimize the cities that we have. They can go to the city planning council and say, there's a traffic block here. If you change the lighting, you would be able to model the, the data flow, the traffic flows in cities, and change how we actually live. Only with 12 million people, right? And Empatica is uh, the sensor I was wearing. What does that mean that a system like Facebook could study our emotions and know that I liked something just when I looked at it? That's coming. Uh, there's an Israeli company that just showed me an iPhone that's using the camera in the iPhone, nothing special, and can see your eye track within millimeters and know what you're looking at, know what you're reading, know whether your eye tracked on something and keyed in on a, on a sentence and you're studying it and you're reading it. It knows that you liked it before you click like or even think about it. Think about the data that will kick off if every single one of your iPhones and Android phones was able to do that and kick more data into Flipboard or whatever system studying it. And we go shopping. I went, visited coupons.com last year, last week, sorry. Uh, they got $200 million of funding uh, it's a million dollar uh, company now, a billion dollar company, and they're studying your shopping list, right? And imagine if everybody used that and put eggs, you can talk to it by the way, you can say eggs, cookies, milk, cereal, you know, and it just parses that and puts it in the shopping list and then it puts a little coupon next to it for the, those objects and tries to get you to buy Oreos for the cookies or whatnot. This stuff is gonna be really pretty crazy. Anyways, I'm going to stop talking because I could keep going. Uh, I, I like talking about the future and about face detection and all sorts of fun stuff. But we're talking about big data and what I'm, I'm really proud to be on this panel because uh, these guys built this stuff and it's really pretty crazy. Um, I'm going to uh, invite, first of all, I'm going to invite uh, James Phillips, director and co-founder of uh, SVP at Couchbase. They built a... NoSQL database, we're going to learn a lot about what NoSQL is, right? And uh, you're going to give a little presentation, and then we're going to have a panel discussion. Sounds good, thanks. Am I live? Yep. You hear me? Okay, good. We're going to switch over here. So as Robert said, and uh, if you guys have ever seen his, uh, his videos, he goes around to the coolest startups. And like yours. Well, what a <laughs> job, right? You get to go visit a bunch of interesting startups. He sticks a, a Canon 5D in your face, and uh, it's very intimidating, but... Um, I had the good fortune of having that done. So uh, I am a co-founder of a company called Couchbase. We're a NoSQL database company. Um, what the hell is that? We'll talk about that. Um, it's, it's one of a trillion buzzwords that are thrown around. Um, you can see uh, a subset of the trillion here. And, and the problem, I think, at this point is that a lot of this stuff gets conflated, right? You, you hear about Hadoop and NoSQL and MongoDB and Couchbase and uh, it's, it's difficult to parse through all that and understand <clears throat> where the real opportunities are, uh, where, where the trends really are, what problems are really being addressed or not being addressed. And if there's anything that, that I'd like you to take away from tonight is that you can make it really, really simple, right? If you focus on the technology, you do find a lot of similarities, right? So one of the, 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 the trends or, or the themes that sort of runs through a lot of these solutions is that data tends to be distributed across a lot of commodity servers, right? So distribution of data um, tends to be schemaless. So when you're putting data into some of these big data or NoSQL systems, you don't have to predefine the type of data that you can put in, precisely what the records look like. Uh, and so the technology, if you get really laser focused on that, can be confusing, right? But if you look at what problems are actual users struggling with, it becomes a lot simpler. Uh, there really are two big problems that are being addressed right now. One is 
big data. We've all heard about it, right? Uh, how do you take mountains of information, as Robert just described, and, and learn from it, right? Identify trends, try and um, pull information out of this mountain of data. The other problem, which gets less attention, but I would argue is equally uh, urgent and, and certainly as uh, widely adopted at this point, is what I like to call sort of a big user or big audience problem. Uh, it's, I may not have tons and tons of data, but if I've got millions and millions of users that need access to data, I'm gonna have a problem too. It's an I.O. problem. How do you get data in and out of a database to support an application? And NoSQL, or the big audience problem, is what I'm gonna focus on, right? So Couchbase is a NoSQL, big audience, big user company. And, uh, and we're focused on interactive software systems, right? And so let's talk about <clears throat> interactive software and how it's changed. If you go back to 1975, when relational database technology, which is sort of the, you know, the off-the-shelf standard selection if you're looking for a database, and you look at the environment in which that technology was invented, look at three axes. You know, what kind of software was being written? What was the user population like of those interactive software systems and the infrastructure? You see vast differences between then and today. Um, the kinds of software that was being built, we were really computerizing what were traditionally uh, human executed business processes. I was being a, a teller automation system or a travel uh, reservation network. I could go into a bank and study the forms. I knew that customers came in, they filled this out, they handed it to this person, they filled out this ledger, they enter office. Very, very structured data formats, very predictable. Uh, and the user population, right? If I had 2,000 users, of an interactive live software system in 1975, I was bleeding edge large, right? I, maybe Bank of America's Teller Network was that large. Uh, and, and from an infrastructure perspective, uh, it was a centralized computing environment, right? That was the norm. You had a mainframe, you had a mini computer. Distributed computing didn't exist except for terminal services, which is certainly not the same thing. Memory was very expensive and very scarce. <clears throat> if you look at the systems that are being built today, just about every interactive software system that's being written today, if it's interesting, has a browser sitting on the front end, right? Uh, these are applications that are not, let's go study some forms and figure out how to go render that in software. We're changing the way people communicate, the way they're in relationship, the way they shop, the way they get information. Very dynamic, we're inventing the business processes and we need a very flexible database system that can support these sorts of, uh, of dynamic, uh, you know, processes that are being invented. From a user perspective, uh, the number of users of these systems, if you've got a browser sitting on the front end, it's hanging on the public internet, you've got two billion potential users of your application. You can't predict how many will use it, you don't know when they're gonna show up, you don't know when they're gonna leave, they certainly don't tell you they're not coming back, so very, very dynamic. Uh, and the infrastructure, very obvious, right? Uh, if you compare today's computing environment, which is all about scaling out commodity hardware, ubiquitous high-performance uh, data networking, distributed computing, vastly different environment. And so if you look at a typical interactive software system with a browser sitting on the front end, it kind of looks like this, right? Uh, you've got a browser, tends to come into a load balancer, gets fanned out to a set of commodity application or web servers. Uh, if you look at the economics of, of that particular uh, part of the tier, or that, that, that tier in the, in the architecture, Beautiful curves, right? I've got another thousand users, rack up another commodity box, update the load balancer, off we go. So it's very easy to scale out. Uh, you've got this nice linear sort of stair step cost function and you can maintain performance <clears throat> almost indefinitely. But if you look at the database tier, if you're using relational database technology, very different. This is technology that was built for a centralized computing environment with shared everything, right? Where you've got um, where, where it's assumed that the data set can fit on a node and memory and disk is available to all the compute nodes. The scaling model is very different. It tends to increase uh, monotonically and asymptotically from a performance perspective. At some point, you just can't get a big enough box to continue to scale up. And from a cost perspective, it also increases nonlinearly because you, you tend to have to buy, rather than one more cheap commodity box, a bigger, highly engineered, you know, say, sunbox that, uh, that, that requires more dollars per MIPS typically. And so what we do is uh, we build a, a database tier that looks like, you know, the application scaling tier. 
Just like you scale your app tier today by adding more boxes and updating the load balancer, Couchbase server or other NoSQL database systems allow you to slap more commodity boxes in as you need it to distribute the I.O. against the given data set to continue to maintain performance and from an economics perspective, continue to get that, that nice linear curve. By the way, this slide is already obsolete. A company that came out of Stanford, NYSERA, is virtualizing the load balancer and the networking infrastructure to fit into these low-cost uh, distributed data centers. Awesome. <laughs> My slides are obsolete. OK, um, so uh, this is a. That's a, Silicon Valley. You know? Yeah, it's just the way it rolls. <laughs> So if you look at, uh, at this slide, uh, draw something which some of you may or may not have heard of was a, a game that launched on the 6th of February, uh, ended up going viral, grew to 50 million downloads in 50 days. They had 15 million daily active users at, at, uh, at, at uh, the end of, or the, the kind of toward the end of March when they were acquired by Zynga. So our database was behind this application and allowed them to keep that game up and running 24 by 7, there was never a microsecond of downtime as they continued to grow and grow and grow the data tier to allow this kind of viral growth to continue very cost effectively. But um, the, we, in, in December of last year, we went out and talked to uh, about 1,000, about 1.5K people and asked them, why are you adopting NoSQL technology, right? It's not just for scaling problems, performance problems, the number one reason this technology is being adopted according to users is because it doesn't require you to manage a schema, right? You've got the ability to insert whatever data you'd like, be very flexible with your ability to capture and use data, and sort of make it up on the back end, if you will, when you query. So it's not just a big web application problem, it's a flexibility solution as well. Uh, here are some of our users. So talking about the business now, uh, one of the concerns that, uh, that, we, that we had going into this was, uh, is this just going to be you know, for the Facebooks and the Zyngas and, and the, you know, the large consumer web property companies? And, and it's turning out that the answer is no, right? If you look at the colorized logos here, we're doing business with verticals uh, that, that span from financial services to healthcare to, uh, to insurance to media. Just about every vertical you can imagine from a traditional industry perspective, we are, uh, we're doing commercial business. So it's, it's not just for uh, the bleeding edge Silicon Valley companies. Another challenge with the business um, is that this is open source software, right? How do you make money if, uh, if you're giving away your intellectual property? You can't make it up in volume. That was a lame attempt at a joke, I think. <laughs> um, but the, uh, the, the way that we've addressed that is, uh, is by actually um, charging for the binary, right? So we sell software. If you look at our business model, it's very much like Oracle, right? If you want to deploy into production a database system that we provide, we charge per server that that database so software is deployed on. Now, it's true that some users could come grab the source code, compile it, build a binary, and put that in production, but we've been very successful in, in, in running the model where we say, here's our certified binary. We've built it. We've run it through QA. We've made a lot of fixes because we found some problems. They'll make them back, in, they'll make back into the source code eventually. But we know what this binary is, and we know how to patch it, and we can maintain this in production. <clears throat> and it's uh, because we are a transactional database, we're the system that sits underneath the application. When our database is down, the application is down. If the application's down, you stop going viral, right? And so because we're a critical infrastructure component, we've been very successful in pursuing that model, whereas a lot of traditional open source companies <coughs> have not been quite as successful. So two last slides here. One is, what have we done right? And the other is, what have we done wrong? Um, I would say that the three most important verbs for a startup are these. Probably the most important one is focus, right? Uh, there's an old saying in Silicon Valley, uh, very few uh, startups have died of hunger, but the road is littered with dead, uh, dead companies from indigestion, right? If you've got a finite set of resources, you've got to pick and choose where you're gonna go fight. And we've been very, very focused initially on the problem that we were gonna solve, and then further 
on the people for whom we were going to solve that problem. We'll grow from there, but you've got to pick your battle to start with. The second is simplify. Another big problem tends to be uh, you know, going and building the God box or boiling the ocean or trying to solve all the problems that, that, uh, that one could imagine that need to be solved in that focused market opportunity that you're pursuing. Um, but, but that tends to also be the road to ruin, right? And uh, less is, is, is more, right? The, the, you want to get to market as quickly as you can with the minimally acceptable product in order to start learning so you can then improve that product based on real market feedback. It's one thing to go out and talk to a bunch of folks and show them slides and ask them if they'd buy your product if you went off and built it. It's a very different thing to ask someone to write a check. And they tend to get really honest with you when you ask them for money. And so the quicker you can start doing that, the better off you'll be. And then finally, uh, be willing to adjust. Uh, I believe that the biggest advantage startups have versus you know, Oracle, right, where, where you've got billions and billions of dollars in capital, thousands and thou tens of thousands of employees is the ability to move quickly, right? That is the only competitive advantage that we have versus that organization, right? We can make fast decisions, we can learn quickly, we can pivot, and we can get stuff out to market much more quickly <clears throat> than a large organization can, right? So focus, simplify, adjust. Now for the bad stuff. Ah, eh, you don't get it. Um, so, this is, as they say, an ongoing investigation. I've got competitors on the stage. And uh, so there's a lot of stuff I'd love to tell you that, uh, that we screwed up, uh, and we screwed up more than our fair share. Uh, and this is also selfish for me, right? So, if you are an entrepreneur and you want to build a company and you want to learn from our mistakes, I'd love to tell you, right? So, there's my email address. Shoot me an email. They're all, you, they're all on Google. I'll anyways. buy you coffee, <laughs> and, uh, and we'll talk about the mistakes that we've made. Right? So that's it. Thanks. Thanks, James. So this, pan this panel is a really diverse panel, and that is really going to pay off, I hope, in the next half an hour. Uh, we have a VC to tell us what the future is like, right? what you're investing in, because VCs try to go where the puck's going to go. right? You're trying to invest for two years from now, something like that? meet people that can figure out where the puck's going to go. Introduce yourself, uh, Ravi. So uh, my name is Ravi Mohan. I've been a venture capitalist for the last 16 years. And um, I'm now at Chasta Ventures. And we invest in um, technology service companies whose customers are either enterprises, small to mid-sized businesses, or consumers. Uh, we have a $265 million fund. Right now, it's our third fund, and it's active. Uh, you know, Like anyone who's investing in the enterprise today, we're looking at cloud-based companies, platform as a service companies, software as a service companies, and big data companies. But there is a misconception in my mind about venture capitalists being able to see the future. I think entrepreneurs see the future. And our ability is to, to recognize whether we buy into their vision and have the courage to join them. And if we do that correctly some of the time, then we're able to still be venture capitalists. Yeah. And, uh, but very rarely do we know where the puck is going. Uh, and Andrew, uh, you're, you're representing both the old world that was described on these slides and the new <laughs> world, right? Because you work at Oracle, which builds some of those big centralized databases, and you're building the new NoSQL style decentralized uh, systems, right? Sure. Yeah. We, so introduce yourself. We do the... any kind of. Uh, so I'm Andy Mendelson. I run uh, the database development group at Oracle. And I go back way to the ancient history that they were talking about, back to the 80s. I, I started Oracle as a developer. And uh, it's been quite a wild ride. You know, Oracle is still run by the founder. You know, we were a startup back then, and Larry Elson's still running the company. And it's a very exciting place to be. Uh, Larry's a, a very interesting character, as some of you probably know. And uh, we've had a lot of fun there over the years, um, rolling through all the different ways of technology that have, have come out over the last 30 years. And uh, we think we've got, we actually are a pretty fast-moving fast company. Very cool. And uh, Doug, Doug Cutting has invented pretty much everything that was described here, I think, or your teams have. But in introduce yourself, Doug. Uh, I'm Doug Cutting. Um, I've uh, been in the software business for 25 years or so. Um, uh, spent the first half of that 
really focused on, maybe even more than half, but focused on search engine technologies. Um, uh, and uh, the last uh, dozen years or so, I've been working on open source technologies, some of them search related and some of them not so much search related. Um, uh, so I, I started the um, Lucene project, it was the first open source project that I, that I started in uh, 2000. Um, uh, Nutch, Hadoop, uh, Avro, uh, or other, other projects. Um, I currently am uh, on the uh, chair of the board of directors at the Apache Software Foundation, um, where all the, the projects that I worked on are uh, hosted. Um, and I work at Cloudera. A real god on the stage, so thank you for being here, because it's not every day I get to have you on a panel. And uh, Max, uh, MongoDB seems to be used by a lot of the startups I cover, and you guys are uh, powering that, right? Yeah, we're, uh, we're having a lot of fun. We're growing really fast. Um, so this isn't the fight I was expecting to have with, with James, a little friendly competition here, <laughs> but I, I was kind of hoping that what James and I would tell Andy is, you know, there's not really much new going on with these things. And, <laughs> and you know, we're probably just a fad and relational <laughs> is, is going to win out and nothing's going to change. We should have talked. We should have uh, talked beforehand. <laughs> I, I didn't share this plan with uh, James here, so he, he spilled the beans. I, I agree with uh, a lot of what he said, and I think it's a really interesting time. You know, when, when Andy joined Oracle, it was a startup, and the database world was really exciting uh, in the 80s. I joined, <laughs> I joined Oracle in 1994, and you know, it's been like close to 20 years of kind of a boring world uh, of databases. When I joined Oracle, it was you know, Oracle and IBM and Informix and Sybase. And then you know Microsoft sort of stole half of Sybase, and SAP yep. bought the other half, and IBM bought Informix, and now it's Oracle, IBM, and Microsoft in the database world. And that 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 was the last 20 years or so of history. But I think history has has not ended in in the database world, and we're in for an interesting time. And there are a lot of opportunities to create. Uh, that ecosystem around data management uh, for for the next 20 or 30 years. Yeah, and you already met James. So, um, you know, when I, I, I'm pretty lucky, I get to go and see stuff that most people can't go see, like these huge, huge data centers that run Facebook. Facebook is a, has three of these 300,000 square foot data centers, and they look just like your slides, just lots of little machines. In fact, they don't even have boxes around them anymore. They're going to the Google model of just a motherboard plugged into an Ethernet port with a power cable, and there's hundreds of thousands of these machines in, the, in these data centers. Um, how is that, how, what is happening in this world of decentralized data centers? Could it, I remember walking around with Zuckerberg four years ago and he was talking to another entrepreneur about sharding and about uh, 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 Memcached and doing all sorts of caching to try to get the scale out of his database because his systems were seeing you know, rapid growth, right? Which is leading to this IPO on Friday. The world now is different, isn't it? Are, are we still in the memcached D world and the sharding? The sharding means you split the database up on yeah. to many, many machines, right? So yeah. my, my query into Google hits a different machine than his query yep. does, right? Yeah, so the, I mean, the relational database technology has, you know, obviously, um, humans hate to change, turns out, right? Yep. People do not like to change. And so there have been uh, and, uh, tons of tactics to try and, continue to make relational database technology relevant, even in areas where it may no longer be relevant, right? And so there have been a lot of strategies. One is, uh, first let's step back and, and talk about what is the relational model, right? You take a record and you split it up into a bunch of tables with, with foreign key and, and relationships, right? So I stripe my record all over the place. When I want to update something, I've got to lock all these tables down, do the update. If I update one table before getting the other one, and the power kills, I have to unwind all that. So it's a, it's a technology that really is optimized for, I'm in control of this database on a box, right? Um, but again, if you're trying to scale, you get these bigger boxes and eventually they fall over. And, and so the, the, the strategy has been, okay, well, I'm gonna partition my data, right? I'll put half the 
it, you know, my customers on the east of the Mississippi here, west of the Mississippi there, and so now I've got two databases to deal with. It's disruptive. If I get even bigger, I've got to split this database in half, update my application. So um, sharding or partitioning becomes very complex to manage. And um, with, with Memcached, which is a distributed caching technology that, that got, uh, that, that's deployed in tens and tens of thousands of websites, the goal was to uh, put a layer of, of memory, distributed memory, in front of the relational database to accelerate reads, right? And so, again, a Band-Aid, really, to, to fix the back-end database technology, which was ultimately the problem. And so what NoSQL database technologies attempt to do is to fix the problem versus deploy a bunch of tactics uh, w without paying the price of losing query expressiveness because your data is spread across a lot of nodes uh, and without having to manage multiple tiers of infrastructure in order to get the performance you need. So the memcached sharding techniques that have been used to make relational technology relevant in areas where that maybe it's not the ideal solution uh, are, are good concepts but the real solution was to fix the database itself. If you watch my Twitter feed, you'll see a, an artifact of NoSQL, right? Um, a tweet might come down and then another tweet will jump in the middle of the stream once in a while. Is, is that uh, because the databases that are building tweets in this tweet stream are decentralized and are on many, many machines and are being re-centralized somewhere? And is that a problem? Is there a, a reason that you shouldn't use NoSQL? Anybody, anybody want to take that? Oracle guy? <laughs> I, that's called a softball, man. <laughs> I, can't, I can't comment on what, uh, what uh, Twitter is doing with their databases. But uh, um, I, th I think um, all these comments about relational databases not scaling, it's, it's sort of interesting to listen to. Uh, the reality of the world is that um, relational databases have evolved over the years to scale incredibly. I mean, we run everything from small business up through Amazon.com. It's all Oracle databases. Um, the sharding technology that they were talking about is used um, in NoSQL databases. It's used everywhere. I mean, this is not like something that went away or was, uh, was thrown away by, by NoSQL. NoSQL is actually doing the exact same thing. You, you hash partition or whatever you want to call it, it's, it's all the same thing. Um, so I guess at some level, I, I guess just to object a little bit to what my, my esteemed colleagues are saying, um, we think we actually scale quite well. And yeah, Facebook is, is sort of the extreme end and nothing can, can work for Facebook, right? They have to do special engineering or Google. But fortunately, most of the world is not Facebook and Google and the people that pay us lots of money uh, don't quite need to scale out like Facebook and Google. And it's true, uh, nothing off the shelf can, can deal with that. Uh, but uh, we deal with 99% of what everybody is doing, and, and we're, we have a pretty good business doing that. So Doug, Doug, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Doug this is the hype versus uh, reality, I guess, uh, argument, right? Where do you see, if you were sitting down with an entrepreneur who's building a business, how would you talk through what database architecture that they should choose? Um, Tell me a little bit about the thinking process. So like if you were talking to a Waze or a Flipboard and you were uh, saying, hey, let's, let's think about your database architecture, what, what would you be asking and what would you be looking at? I think it depends on what sort of data you're dealing with. Um, if you've got transactional data um, uh, where you need to process it online, um, uh, then uh, an Oracle database is going to do a good job for you. Um, that's really... Um, uh, what it was designed to do and what it, what it continues to do very well um, uh, and, and relational databases are, are still the, probably the best tools for, for many of those kinds of operations. Um, uh, if what you've got is a lot of unstructured data, you're not exactly sure what you're going to do with it. Um, uh, it's, uh, the volume is tremendous. Um, uh, the analyses you might do are um, somewhat freeform. Uh, you might be looking to um, predict um, uh, where people are going to click. You might be looking to analyze um, how well your page layout is doing. You might be looking to analyze whether somebody is going to default on a loan. You might be looking for oil under the ground. Um, so things that aren't, aren't black and white questions uh, in a, in a non-transactional system, things like that, um, you've got much more of a, of a big data problem. Um, uh, one of the things we, we didn't talk about yet 
um, as we talk a little about the technologies uh, and, and how they're structured, but there's also the economics. Um, I, think, I think one of the things that's led to the adoption of a lot of these technologies is not just that they do the job well, um, but they do it cheaply. Um, and so the, the open source is a, is a big part of that. Um, uh, that that's a, it's a good price for software. Um, and uh, building on, on commodity hardware um, is another big advantage um, uh, that you can, you can get very, very cost effective hardware, um, shop it around against multiple vendors. The, the whole stack is really being opened at the same time. The data center itself is being opened with open compute, which Facebook started and now has a foundation running it. The cloud computing layer, we've, uh, Rackspace kicked off an open, open standard called OpenStack, right? And on and on. And then you guys with Hadoop are sitting up on top of that. It's really interesting. What, why does uh, having the stack be open matter to developers? What, what can they do with an open stack like that that they couldn't do with a closed stack? So part of it is the price. Um, uh, and I think it's also there's some other things. I think the, the ease with which they can evaluate, um, the ease which they can diagnose. You've got an open source system. Um, something doesn't happen the way you expect it. You can dive right in and debug it directly uh, because you've got the source. It's, it's transparent. Um, uh, you find a problem, um, you can submit the fix because you can, you can look at Usually you can you probably figure out a workaround. Um, you, you may not need to, to actually change the, the source. Um, lastly, um, I think people uh, are often times, often, oftentimes uncomfortable with proprietary software because it can, uh, it can get locked in. If you're, you're relying on a vendor um, for something that is critical to your business, uh, then that vendor may raise the prices um, uh, that vendor may go out of business, um, and, uh, and then where are you? You're stuck. Um, whereas if you've got an open source project, um, in particular open source projects with a, a large base of companies collaborating, um, then you've got a very resilient distributed system that's developing your software. So the same things you look for in your software, uh, you want a resilient distributed system uh, for the same reason. So in case any, any one fails, you're, you're, you're not stuck. Um, I think you want in your, in your, your software production system. And, and open source projects like those at Apache have that property, uh, that they're, they're developed by a diverse group. Um, and so you, 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 you get the low cost, um, but you also get the, the reliability that it's, it's not going to go away and not change its, its cost over time. Yeah. Max, uh, you know, MongoDB is used by all sorts of companies. How, how do you find that these companies, because MongoDB is not the only choice that right. is out there. Uh, you know, we have a couple others here. How, how are you finding customers are or should evaluate these technologies and choose the right one for them? What are some of the things that, they sh that the entrepreneurs should think about when they're uh, thinking about choosing Mongo or now there's new ones like Firebase or Meteor or CouchDB sure. or, I mean, there's so many choices out there. <laughs> so first, it, w without making it a MongoDB a advertisement, one of the things that Doug really s resonated with me was around the openness or around evaluation. Right, uh, I think that decisions are, are moving much more to developers. There's a real sense of empowerment, right? The job market is good and developers don't wanna be told what tool to use to do their job, they, they wanna pick. And, and that happens more in startups and small companies, but I think as that sort of web spirit gets into larger organizations and younger people uh, with different attitudes kind of rise up in the ranks, uh, I see a lot more decisions being made by developers and architects that, than by CIOs. And so they want to download something and they want to use it and they want to run the thing that, that they feel like is productive and they can get the job done with, right? So their you know, scalability matters in some cases, but agility and ease of use and, and what's natural and, and productive and elegant I think matter a lot to developers. The other thing that I think that they look for is an active community where, where you know, never mind a support subscription from, from an evil vendor to some people, I'm just as evil a vendor as him, right? It, the, that I, I want to be able to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I want people to be able to, people want to be able to go to, you know, Google Groups and ask a question and get an answer. Yeah. Um, and, and I think those sorts of things are becoming more and more important in how software de decisions are made. And I'm just uh, really happy a lot of people seem to be 
choosing MongoDB. They like the experience of developing with it and the support the community provides. So just try to keep improving it. Yeah. When I, when I go visit uh, startups today, it, like at Flipboard today, they have these huge LCD screens right in the middle of the office. I call them uh, data porn walls. So they call them dashboards. But they're able to watch their system in real time, whether it's responding to customers worldwide, right? New, new Relic, when you check in code, lets you see your servers and whether uh, that check in of code has decreased the, the responsiveness of the system worldwide or increased it. And he, uh, Marcy McHugh told me, you know, uh, Mike is over in Asia right now because that's where the growth is for Silicon Valley app companies. China is coming online at a horrid, a torrid pace, and they're seeing such growth that they're spending a lot of time there. You know, this is leading to new kinds of data center architectures, right? We now need to think about not just a centralized database, but a series of data centers around the world that work together. How is that changing? How are both things changing? The, the ability to see uh, what's going on with your systems, the transparency of what's going on, so that you can jump on it and fix something that's not working right, but also being able to scale this worldwide uh, across multiple data centers, which is becoming a new kind of problem. Do you want me to take? Okay. E e anybody who wants sure. to take it. Uh, so I think the visibility is an increasing requirement for customers. One of the things that we've been really uh, happy with the, the response to is the monitoring service that we built. So we built a monitoring service for Mongo users where you install an agent and it'll send data back and, and uh, tell us and you uh, what, what's going on with your server. So it's a SaaS-based monitoring system and everybody can use it whether you're a customer or not because we want all the free users to be successful also. And so we've got 5,000 organizations using the thing and we're doing 3 billion updates a day. And you know, it's a great example of the possibilities that these new technologies open up because for a small amount of commodity hardware and a developer working for a couple of months, we can build a system that, that processes 3 billion transactions a day on, on half a dozen commodity servers, right? Uh, and, and that really improves the support experience because then when someone calls up, uh, you know, they don't have to go through five round trips of, we'll send me this log file and run this command and tell me what it says. All that's in front of us, we dig through it and we get right to the, to the point. So I think that visibility we're seeing in, in our business is, is really something that, that customers want. Now there's firewall issues, so you can imagine there's some government agencies and banks and things that won't let us install the agent no matter how much we promise it only sends back systems utilization in information. So that, that's sort of the, the visibility. The multi-data center thing opens up a whole new world of challenges, which is one of the big areas we're working on in our upcoming release around uh, policies about which data can be replicated from which data center to which data center. If you have personal data in Europe, that can't leave Europe. If you have data in Malaysia, that, that can't leave Malaysia, at least in terms of the server it resides on, it might be queryable by an application elsewhere. So a as you go to these global distributed networks, you need to be able to set policies for, for these types of things in, in the servers. I think there, there uh, are a whole new set of challenges to, to deploying systems. R Robbie, what are you seeing as opportunities for entrepreneurs to build new kinds of companies. I mean, Rackspace bought CloudKick, which was a monitoring company, and gave our customers access to, you know, this kind of transparency. But well, what, I, what are I, you I, seeing? I think it, you know, for, I think I think that what what's available now, because the cost curves are so much cheaper, you're going to have new data sets that people are going to explore and find new solutions around. And I think that the possibilities of looking at all this log data before that, that wasn't possible before. So if you were trying to offer a database monitoring service before as a startup, it would be really, really hard to do it. But now you can, you know, through, you know, you guys are doing it and other people will do it, can offer a data monitoring service. We'll collect your logs, we can process them efficiently, we can have our own algorithms or knowledge work on that and then provide you back insight. But that's just for database logs. Splunk just went public, right, and does m largely that, right? Yeah, I mean, what Splunk said was, look, if you look at the actual systems architecture for systems management, and you look at it for business intelligence, the basic architecture is the same. You collect data from a bunch of different spots, you put it in a 
in a, in a repository and you run rules against it and you fire off alerts and create dashboards, whether it's for BI or systems management. And Splunk said, hey, let's not do that. Let's just give the person at the front line the ability to search the information. That's what they start. Um, and just like that, I think that's what's going to happen in business intelligence. I think that people are going to take all their database, uh, put it into memory, a lot of their structured information, put the metadata there, because unfortunately you do need some metadata, uh, so you can't just be completely schemaless, and let people search and, and answer a lot of questions that way. But coming back to your core question, I think that what's, what's interesting is because you can put more data in one place much more cheaply, and you could run different processes on it much more easily, what you couldn't do before, you can do today. And some smart entrepreneurs are going to figure out some great business models around it, whether it's a fraud detection service, whether it's a traffic monitoring service. I don't know. But yeah. the fact is you can collect lots of data, slap algorithms on it, and come up with new insights. And that's what we will fund. We will fund companies that aren't just providing the infrastructure, because I think that's wave one of what's going to happen. We're going to fund companies that are going to use that infrastructure to provide a service of business value to customers. What, what I found interesting when I visited Betaworks in New York, which is the home of Bitly, uh, Bitly is sharing the data scientist at, um, with several other companies. There's news.me now, and there's other companies that are being born in one building because they have this new data, uh, this new understanding of data and a new pattern recognizer, right? Yeah, and, and there's a startup started by a bunch of Informatica guys that's getting off the ground, which is just offering to use technology that a lot of the companies here provide, uh, but integrate it all in one package to provide the data science back in as to who's using what of somebody's service. Because in order for Flipboard to understand how their product is working, they need a lot of technical expertise to stitch all the different components together and then do the analysis to answer the questions they need as to how their service is being used. So a startup could package all of that together, offer it as a service, uh, and that's the kind of thing that we will fund. When VCs talk about big data, what do they mean? What, what kinds of companies are I don't are know what they mean. <laughs> uh, uh, to, me, what, you know, to me, I think that I think there's a lot of stuff that corporations are going to use in memory. And the size of that data doesn't, in many cases, fit in the lines of big data. I think that if, if you are trying to understand what's happening on your websites as people buy stuff, well, you're going to have a ton of big data. I think that's a really great use case where you're trying to figure out who's going to go buy what, when, and what offer can I put in front of them to convert. Well, then you're going to be looking at all these interaction logs, and you see what people are doing in all that clickstream. And that's probably a huge chunk of where these guys' business is coming from, is my, uh, my perception. Uh, I think in fraud, there's going to be a bunch of uh, use cases. But a lot of the business use cases, coming back to what Doug said, you know, in a, in a big company, you, a relational database solves most of those business use cases. Yeah. That's what the guys at Burroughs and Wang, they, they, they were looking down their nose at Oracle back in uh, 1980, I think. I saw the same dynamic play out on stage at that point. Same dynamic. Well, I mean, uh, would you put your purchasing system on your... Uh, Absolutely. On, uh, on, okay, sure. Uh, 100%. Yeah, and we, you think that... We just in, sat behind a $200 million exit where purchases were running through our system. So all the commits on every single purchase that happened, all the logs, all the billing, everything happened on your system? 100%. That's great. System of record. <laughs> That's impressive, actually. <laughs> uh, anybody else want to jump in on what is big data and, and from your point of view and how you define big data? Um, one of the things is several quantity? people have talked about is um, uh, schemaless or unstructured and things like that. Um, and I think that can be a little confusing. I think just about any kind of data, unless it's just random noise, um, uh, has structure. Um, and, uh, and you can devise a schema to describe that structure. Um, but the difference tends to be in, in uh, I think what the, the systems people call big data systems, uh, is that you save the data in the form that it's produced um, pretty directly. Uh, and don't try to restructure it to conform to how you want to view it later. I think a classic approach has been to develop a schema 
based on the sort of queries you want to do and the way you want to um, analyze the data later. And then as, you, as, you, as the data comes in, you restructure it to conform to that schema. Um, and in big data systems, people tend not to do that. They tend to just save the data as it comes in uh, and then restructure it on the fly or, um, or later uh, as needed. Um, and the, the advantage of that um, is that you can change your mind about um, what sort of analyses you might want to do um, and you don't lose any, any details of the data. Um, and one of the, again, it was one of these cost things. It only makes sense if you can afford to, to save it. Um, and uh, open source solutions on commodity hardware um, tend to make it easier to save more of that data uh, and then be able to structure it, uh, restructure it yeah. on the fly when you later. Need it. Yeah. Uh, so. The, so the audience is asking questions. I'll try to get a few of them in before we end. We're almost out of time. Will NoSQL need to be standardized like SQL is for wider adoption and ease of use? Anybody want to take that one on? Do we need a, a no, no SQL, SQL no standardization standard. no. committee <laughs> in the industry? I think, I, think, I, 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 I think that there are going to be companies that will handle the manageability problems. So I think that you will buy services out there that will handle some of the issues around it. And I don't think that it needs to be standardized. I do think that that's one of the reasons why um, the database world is more interesting right now. You do not have a CIO saying that you need to be SQL compliant, which is, which is a, Oracle is very effective at pushing that agenda forward, but it did kill a lot of database innovation between 97 and 2007 in my mind. Well, one of the points of standards um, is to uh, encourage competing implementations of those standards. Um, and then you can still have interoperability and people can, can move between the platforms. Um, if you've got uh, instead people collaborating uh, on, on the implementation rather than competing on the implementation, then there's less need for the, the standard. You can have a de facto standard. It's, it still can make sense to have a standard and have multiple implementations um, uh, even when people are collaborating. But I, I think it, there's less demand for it in, in this, that kind of market. I, I, go ahead, Max. I think right now the rate of change is too high to have to go through a committee to, to do things, right? Yeah. I, I think someday there probably should be a standard, and I don't know that that's necessarily enormously distant, like decades away, but I, I think right now uh, just the, the rate of change is too high if we had to sit around and, and have a committee for what, what functionality are we gonna add and how is that gonna be expressed, it would slow things down uh, too, too much right now. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. I mean, I do believe that if there was a standard uh, query language mm -hmm. um, that would allow one in a, quote, non-relational or a NoSQL environment to, to have choice between vendor implementations, that it would accelerate the adoption of these technologies. I mean, th there was a, an Im implication, I think, in Doug's assertion that, um, you know, everything's open source and you're cooperating on the implementation and everyone will just pick that and therefore standards aren't important. But, um, it's, it's not the case that commercial entities that are selling software to people who are building businesses uh, are, are going to vaporize, right? And so there will be competing commercial entities building these systems and, and organizations that are going to bet their business on this infrastructure software are going to want to have standards and it's, it's going to have to happen. And, and I'd be happy. Uh, as Couchbase to sit down with MongoDB and, and figure out what that standard should look like. And we don't have to do it in committee form. We can, we can do it with each other. Do it over beers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I said less important. I, I, think, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I certainly agree. Yeah. And um, I, I completely agree. I mean, based on the history of relational databases, we uh, created a standard very early on, and that was very critical in the whole crea creation of the, the ecosystem around, around relational databases. And, Without that, I don't think the business would be anywhere near as, as large as it is today. So. The, the other thing is that SQL plays a big role in the big data world. I mean, there are, there are implementations of um, SQL-like or, or nearly SQL uh, query languages uh, in, in the big data world as well. So there's, 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 there are data stores that are not SQL-based and there are ones that are in, in the big data world, so. Yeah, by the way, I was confused on the clock. Uh, we have 30 more minutes. Uh, we just need to, uh, they were asking me to take questions from the audience and it was confusing me with the clock there. Um, one, one half of this question was sort of answered, but how do you manage atomic transactions and security in the NoSQL model? I think we touched on the uh, transactions, but maybe dig into that a little bit for people who don't understand how, how this stuff is working sure. technically. Sure, so there's, there's a wide range of approaches within the NoSQL world. 
so I'll, I'll first say what, what's in common and then I think what their range is wi within the world, right? The thing that I think none of the NoSQL vendors do that I know of anyway is, is you know, complex multi-statement transactions with, with two-phase commits on, on big clusters because if, if all those smart guys can't figure out how to make that run fast on a cluster of a thousand nodes, we, we didn't want to make that, you know, line item three on the project plan of, of a little startup. So, so we haven't done that. Uh, I, I think that there is a range of consistency models that, that people ha have adopted that, that ranges from an eventual consistency model where, where updates can happen in different servers and, and you sort out the conflicts later, right, to, uh, to an immediate consistency model, but just at, at the level of an update to an individual document. Uh, and there's no right answer for all applications. Uh, uh, you know, er Eric Brewer became famous uh, or more famous for, for a cap theorem that basically said, if you have a distributed system and you, you want it to still be able to take updates when, when it's broken in half, then, then it's, the two halves are gonna be inconsistent with each other, right? So uh, uh, th this is actually kind of common sense and there's no miracle solution to that. So each vendor has to choose how to handle those types of partition situations and what level of, of transactions to support. We think that a certain level uh, of transactions, simple document level transactions, uh, make a developer's life much more productive and they make debugging a system much more predictable than, than having updates coming from all directions. But there are advantages for write availability in an eventual consistency model. So My all choices question, exist. Yeah. Well, what transaction processing systems would you not use MongoDB for? What systems would I not yeah, use like it for? What applications um, would you not use MongoDB for a backend? Sure, uh, so I, I would say there are two broad classes of systems where I wouldn't use it for a backend. And, and I'll be a little bit abstract about them because there are lots and lots of examples in, in each uh, type. One is systems where a relational model is really natural, right? Some data, you look at it and, and it just, you, you model it and it works beautifully in, in tables. Right, so uh, you know, a general ledger system really is a bunch of tables, and mm -hmm. I wouldn't try to build it in a NoSQL system. Uh, the other is systems where I, I really have to do those multi-statement transactions uh, uh, and, and update a whole bunch of different things, and then either commit them or roll them back as a group. So I think if I needed either of those pieces of functionality. I wouldn't use MongoDB because we don't have it and we're not planning to uh, any time in the foreseeable future. Yeah. So I, I would, for, for Couchbase, I would, I would remove that second part in the near-ish term, mm -hmm. right? So um, I, I, the whole point here with regard to transactions, just so we're all speaking the same language, is that when you, when you update information in a database or you write new information in a database, uh, if, if the information that you just wrote references some other information that also needs to be updated and you only kind of get halfway done and the system dies, you need to be able to unwind that later, right? So it's, it's, that's the complexity, in particular in the relational model, because you're spreading your data out, right, by design. You take a record and you've got multiple tables that all point to each other, and when you do an update, if you're halfway done and the system dies, you've got to fix that when you come back up. The, the, a, a denormalized, document-oriented system doesn't use that model. You don't break your records up, it's denormalized. So you basically wrap the transaction boundary around one physical update. Now, if you do want to have cross-document references, then you have to have a system that can, in fact, unwind partially updated records. And I do believe that that functionality will emerge in our system, right? Uh, very much like external TP monitor systems that we've had for a long time, where you know if you updated SAP and you updated a mainframe ledger system, something right. outside's gotta be able to monitor that transaction and make sure that it gets unwound if something fails. So that technology will absolutely enter um, the, the, the NoSQL realm, 
um, but it's not there today. So the you know denormalization is is uh, you look think, confused, Robbie. I don't. I'm not confused. I, yeah. I just think that you're. I think that when you start looking at different use cases, for s different use cases, you have different data structures, which are optimized for those use cases. Um, so, for example, if you're writing uh, an accounting system for a trading application to figure out what a, what a position needs to be or what the risk you're taking, you really want a data, data structure that's focused on time series data, because that's the way the data is coming in, and you want to group it. So. The, the problem that I have with your statements are you're, just, yeah. you're using kind of this general thing of NoSQL and applying it more generically. And I don't believe yeah. that Couchbase database is going to be great for all use cases. I mean, I think there are going to be specific use cases that you're going to be great at, and there are going to be specific use cases that you're not so great at. And I think so the important I, so point I wasn't actually confused. Yeah. Uh, I just disagreed with the oversimplification that you were going down. Okay. So, so, so I disagree with that, and, and I do believe. So you think that for every use case, <laughs> nope, Couchbase will be great? Absolutely not. No. So, oh, so then you don't just, disagree just with that. Just as relational database <laughs> technology eclipsed uh, network and hierarchical technology as a data model for certain use for cases. most use for certain cases, use for cases. general purpose database use cases, right? Not so general you, purpose. That's not true. Relational database technology is absolutely widely considered to be a general purpose database technology. And I would argue. But, but it's not good for business intelligence. That's, uh, uh, really? It's not that great. You <laughs> need different good. structures. <laughs> how, how many billions of dollars do you make off of any? <laughs> That's why they bought a multi-dimensional database to start building their data warehousing stuff, and then they modified it over yeah. time. And yeah. so, so it is a general purpose <laughs> database technology that flips the relational model on its head, right? Versus upfront saying, here's my schema and my inserts need to conform, we, we, it's basically a covariant, right? So we say, insert what you want, right. and apply the schema on the back end. It's, a it's, it's basically a covariant relationship between the relational model, relational algebra, and using the key value model on the back end and using procedural techniques in order to do your queries. Are we getting in the weeds, Andy? <laughs> Well, I just, just to raise things to a higher level, yeah. I mean, w one of the issues with a lot of the NoSQL technology is around a little bit of what, what you guys were talking about. You know, we're talking about, oh, developers should choose the technology. And the problem is uh, the NoSQL products generally have very low-level programmer developer APIs that are very good for doing very simple, you know, transactions, operations, like insert a row, look up a row kind of thing. But if you want to do something complicated, like in a business intelligence application, where you know, you've got pages you know, in SQL, it's pages of SQL, that's going to be hundreds of pages of Java code in a NoSQL database. And it's just not, you know, it's, it's back to the, what Doug was saying about cost. The cost determines a lot of which technology developers are going to use. And if they want to write something complicated, they're not going to use a NoSQL database because it's, it's just too costly for them. They want to just spin off a page of SQL and get the answer back and, you know, not, not write hundreds of pages of code. And that's why relational databases were invented, you know, 30 years ago. And that's why they're still around. It's uh, nobody else has really uh, figured out how to do what SQL can do. Yeah. One question uh, uh, that came in was, um, what are some enterprise use cases for big data? Because we covered the social media side a little bit over heavy. But like HP is making these little vibration sensors that the oil companies are using, right? They string them around, and then they fire off a little explosion, and they study the earth <laughs> underneath us, right, and look for oil. Uh, what other kinds of enterprise use cases are you guys seeing uh, people use big data for, or companies use big data for? Sure. So, um, so I think machine-generated data is a big one, right? Splunk mm -hmm. was very successful having started with those roots, and, and we see a lot of that sort of in similar spirit to, to what you were talking about with, with HP, whether it's sensor data or log files, right? Because as, as much feed as there is on Twitter, right, and 300 million tweets a day, we, we have customers that are processing millions of transactions a second, right? And that's not being typed in by, by you know, human beings on, on keyboards. So machine-generated data is I think really important. I think uh, archiving is, is another interesting one because uh, uh, schema evolution over long periods of time can, can be a challenge. And so the question, you, you have these archives 
and, and every couple of years, you know, you, you're changing your schema. How can you have these different epochs of data coexisting together in, in an archive without having to run these giant data migrations on billions of rows each time you have a minor schema change? So that's another place uh, that, that things are coming into to the enterprise. I think one area where where relational is sometimes a challenge from a data modeling perspective. I think there are a lot of places where it fits really naturally and, and SQL can be very powerful and expressive, but sometimes in metadata management, you can be trapped between these really wide, sparse schemas and these really tall, tall thin <laughs> tables and, and neither of them works very well and some of the schema flexibility can be helpful for metadata management as well. So those are some of the cases where, where we see enterprises uh, looking a lot at, at uh, our, our technologies anyway. How, how accurate, uh, here's a question. On, on Google, they always say a number up at the top of the page, you know, 383,000 people <laughs> linked to, you know, talk about Scoble, for instance. And that number is total bullshit. Anybody who's in the, the industry for any length of time knows that number is an approximation. It's not <laughs> accurate. Is that a cause of uh, NoSQL databases that are decentralized that aren't uh, being built for accuracy and are being built for de the decentralized nature of them and, and the uh, speed issues? Or is yeah, th There's no reason you can't get very precise results from uh, from distributed databases, right? You can distribute the counting work across the databases and there's some semantics as to as of when the, the count happened and the synchronization of vector clocks or whatever, right? But I, I don't think that's the level of inaccuracy that you're talking about, that like there were three extra ones added while the results were, were being counted. So, um, and, and there are solutions to have well-defined synchronization there. So I, I think it's just a matter of of the amount of compute resource it takes uh, and attendant I.O. to get precise counts ver versus accurate counts. And in a lot of use cases, uh, versus approximate counts. And in a lot of use cases where an approximate count quickly is better than a, a precise count. When I do a Google search for, for uh, the word Fred, right, I, I don't actually care if there are 1 billion or 1.1 billion results. I just need to see that there are way more results then I can actually page through and I better add a last name if I want to be able to find something. So I'd rather see that instantly than 1,321,723,409 after five seconds. Yeah. Um, are, are there any other architectural choices that you have to make when you go to a non-SQL approach versus a SQL approach like that just to, to keep compute costs down or to or to keep speed up, or to, or to make the system work in a decentralized way? I mean, I'd say that, that the, the biggest difference is not actually the query language, right? So I, I, my, my frustration with the name NoSQL is, is that the query language is actually the most superficial difference between the, the systems. So uh, you know, I think some of the big choices, we talked about consistency models and the level of transactions. The, those are big choices. I think another big choice is the data model, right? Do you model things as tables and relations? Do you model them as hierarchically structured documents? Do you model it as columns or as key value pairs or as graphs? And each of those models is gonna fit well with different a applications. So the, those are probably uh, the, the biggest choices uh, that we feel like we made. And then there's just sort of prioritization of functionality and some trade-offs there around, uh, you know, do you prioritize read performance versus write performance or availability versus uh, data size and a lot of, of that. And, and how type. do you go about making those calls? Like, um, is it just based on pull of the use cases? <coughs> It's, you know, there, there's a certain set of decisions that we felt like we had to make to build in a finite amount of time with a relatively small amount of resources. Right. Something that, right so, so we left out uh, joins and, and we left out multi-statement transactions because we didn't think with a finite amount of work we could make them fast at large scale. And then there's a bunch of stuff we thought was necessary to be a reasonably broad use development tool. So you can argue about whether there is even such a thing 
as a general purpose database or a database for everything, but we didn't want to be something that was only useful for a tiny slice of use cases. Mm -hmm. So we felt like things like secondary indexes and immediate consistency and ad hoc queries that not all NoSQL products support were important in being broadly useful for, for a lot of use cases. Um, and then we just tried to make some reasonable trade-offs that, that would perform well for Andy, what, customers. Andy, where do you find your winning customers in this argument? Where, where does Oracle really have a stronger point of view here? Well, than uh, what, you know, we, are, we actually don't argue with our customers at, at this level because <laughs> we understand there is a market space for what now is being called NoSQL databases and what was also called key value stores. We have a NoSQL database and a key value store at Oracle and we sell it to the, the market segment that, that wants that kind of solution. And we sell the Oracle database to a much larger market segment <laughs> that wants that solution. So we don't really you know, say, oh, one is good and one is bad. I, I agree with Ravi. There's a, appropriate use cases for each one. And these technologies have been used for years and years. I mean, these are not like brand new. They've been around for a long time. And people, developers sort of know when to use one versus the other. And we, we don't really say, you know, this is good or this is bad. We, we say, we've got them all. You know, if you want NoSQL, we got that. If you want Relational, we got that. If you want Hadoop, we've got that too. And you know, that, that's really what the customers want. They don't really want us to argue which is better. We'll say, Whatever you want is fine with us. And um, they're, like Ravi said, the developers understand when to use one versus the other. And, uh, this is the new kinder yeah. Oracle, huh? Exactly. We, we, <laughs> <laughs> they've adapted. Yeah, we're driven by my revenue, my money, you know? Like whatever they want to pay us for, we'll be happy to sell it. Uh, another, question, <laughs> another question from the uh, audience. What do you see as the next big data challenge that does not yet have a feasible solution? What's the next killer startup to, that a Stanford start, a student should start? You know? I That's think, tough to answer. Yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're talking, uh, I mean, up on the stage, we're talking a lot about infrastructure, as Ravi said, right? I mean, it's the, the sort of the current wave of, of funded startups, and a lot of the innovation is occurring low level. You know, how do you make the bits and the bytes work? How do you build the, the database technology itself? But I think the, you know, a lot of the real value is going to come by building solutions that use those tools to go solve real business problems, right? To identify um, uses of these technologies that are gonna move the needle for someone's company. And, and I think, and there's, you know, another thing that I think is happening right now is where you're accumulating these very, very large quantities of data, uh, it's becoming imperative that someone understands what the heck it is and how to secure it and to ensure that, uh, you know, the regulations are being complied with. And, a lot of the, the tooling to ensure that the right people have access to the right data and that that data is only moving where it needs to move or can legally be moved. You know, all the sort of the supporting systems that allow one to, um, to, to extract business value and to ensure compliance, I think, is where the next wave of... It sort of yeah. sounds like the kind of arguments we have in the cloud computing space, which is, uh, you know, you're sharing a stack of servers with maybe 100 other customers and how do you make sure that nobody gets to cross over the boundaries? Uh, this is the point that James and I completely agree on. Looking at usability in, is where I would look. So just take a look at the example of New Relic. New Relic is a very successful startup in the systems management world. And they help uh, both uh, developers and operations people manage systems built with multiple open source languages. And what they realized, just coming back to a couple points that other people have, is that not everybody is a God developer that can work at the API levels. And you know, most of us need to have things abstracted with usable solutions. And I think the path that New Relic went down is very instructive, where they started with the systems management and application performance management for Ruby, uh, which was the hottest language in 2005. And over time, there were some limitations as to which use cases Ruby would use for. And so what New Relic did was they said, okay, we'll take the same basic infrastructure that we have and we'll support it for PHP applications, for Python applications, et cetera. And we'll provide the same type of usability. And I think that as we move into different data stores with different data structures, with different manageability, 
making that all usable for an end user is where I would look if I was a startup. Is this panel going to be obsolete in a week? You know, <laughs> I am. <laughs> and the reason I ask, ask that is I've started seeing new startups like Meteor and Firebase that are doing higher level databases, real time databases that abstract even further what we're talking about here. Is that a threat to this NoSQL world? I, I, you have to, I, I think you have to keep going back to who's got what problem and how many people are out there. I mean, you can talk about technology all day long and, and abstraction levels and APIs, but it really comes back to are there actual problems that people are grappling with where existing solutions are inadequate, right? Yeah. And, and we, we deal with that, right? That's, that's, we, we solve a problem that exists, as does uh, Mr. Cutting. Um, well, Doug, I, Doug, if you were 19 today, what would, what would you be working so on? Would you be working on NoSQL databases or would you be I, working on something else? I, my, my hunch as to where the action's going, and I, you know, don't, I don't put a, give any guarantees with this uh, prediction, um, is that it's not about um, social photo sharing uh, apps for mobile <laughs> with location. I don't think there's uh, another Instagram that's going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, I think the, the place to look is um, in more conventional in industries. I think we've got, the, I think the technology stack has matured. I think the, um, the web companies uh, have um, figured out lots of ways to, to deploy this stuff. Um, and, and I think it's time to bring it to agriculture, to bring it to transport, to bring it to, you know, the, the manufacturing, to um, politics and government, um, to really, really think about all these other areas. Because uh, there's a lot more to the economy um, uh, than the internet. It's, yeah. it's hard to believe that. Um, and more and more business is becoming part of the internet. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of times it's, it's, it may be bringing some of these things online more um, and then figuring out what opportunities can, can arise. I think that's a great way to end this panel unless somebody has something even better to punctuate the end of this uh, panel. <laughs> no. with. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>